<laughs> oh, cool. Uh, well, again, thank you for coming out, um, and we have a really big treat for you. Um, please welcome to the stage co uh, actor Kelvin Yu and co creator and act master of none, Alan Yang. Share the mic and help yourself with some boba. <laughs> go through all these. Yeah, we'll go through all of them by the end of this Every conversation. Question. Every question, we have to drink a whole one. Are there are there eight? I request eight bottles. So are there oh, yes, there's eight. Okay, great. I was gonna walk off the stage if there were seven. Okay. So. Well, yes, there's eight, so we're good to go. Good. Well, thank you guys for coming out to campus, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, wonderful show. A uh, wonderful episode, I think it's probably one of the, well, it's one of the best ones. Um, but before we get into the episode, um, I guess I just want to get started at the beginning of your careers, the very beginning. Um, like, at what point in your life did you, like, realize, you're like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to get into entertainment. I want to get into creating. Um, and, you know, of course, like, how were your parents? How was your family? And, yeah. Sure, I'll yeah. start. Um, I was, uh, when I was 14, I auditioned for a school play, and uh, it was kind of your cliche story where a teacher pulled me aside, uh, Mrs. McIntyre, and told me that I should audition, and uh, that stays with me, um, and I think it, I think we can't over overstate how much a moment like that can affect somebody, especially, you know, a young Asian American kid who doesn't necessarily see a path forward, uh, for somebody to go out of their way to uh, sort of advocate for you, I think, is a, is a bigger deal than you might think. I mean, it might not be a big deal to that kid, but it also might be. What was the point? Maybe alone, woman. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I could have I reacted a lot of ways, I guess. Get away from me. Uh, no, but, uh, and then I ended up, uh, by, then I ended up doing a lot of plays, 25 plays throughout my school. Okay. Um, and then in college, uh, I studied theater at UCLA, and somebody came to me and said, they are auditioning, uh, for a 15-year-old kid, a Chinese kid on a show called Popular on the WB, which is like yes. Ryan Murphy's first show. Yes. Uh, and so uh, that was 99 or 2000, and um, I went in, and I think I was ignorant enough to not know what was happening, so I just wasn't nervous and didn't, um, and I ended up getting that. So right away I was thrown into the mix. And um, to answer your second part of the question, my parents were not happy, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, my, uh, my father's a Broadway actor, I'm just kidding, he's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's cur currently in Hamilton. Um, no, he's a, <laughs> you know my father is pretty great, maybe you do. Um, he's an aerospace engineer, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, Hamilton, uh, aerospace yeah, engineer, the same thing. No. Um, and there was a time where he, uh, tried everything in his power to, to get me to stop pursuing that, so, um, yeah, so. We're all opening up here. Yeah. That's what we're here for, yeah. guys. <laughs> but, I was allowed on set. This is the first time. It's like this that. is the first time they're meeting, folks. Yeah. Yeah. You are yeah. with us, yeah. yeah. breaking news yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's my, that's my uh, YouTube Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, man, now I'm jealous. I didn't have a Miss McIntyre. No one told me any of that. <laughs> Me when I was a kid. No, you know, when I was when I was growing up, I loved comedy. You know, I watched a lot of TV. I, I loved Simpsons and Seinfeld, SNL, and I watched a lot of comedy. But I, I grew up in Riverside, California, and, and I don't. I had no conception that this was a job. Like I obviously knew acting was a job, but as far as writing, producing, all that stuff, I, I didn't know those names were the beginning of the show. So um, I always thought it was you know something I enjoyed and I loved make jokes with my friends, but I didn't realize it was really even possible until um, I went to college and I started writing for a comedy magazine in college. And it just changed everything, because all I wanted to do was hang out with funny people, um, be around smart people, make them laugh, and it was the most, it, it just like brought me so much joy. And so that sort of gave me the confidence and the, the really just the, to make the idiotic decision to move to LA and be unemployed, you know, it's just, just a really, really bad, a <laughs> really bad career choice. But, 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 uh, you know, actually, my parents were pretty supportive. My parents, um, at least outwardly, 
they didn't seem like they were going to kill themselves. Um, <laughs> my, my, my dad uh, isn't an aerospace engineer, but he does have a comedy job. He, he, he uh, is an obstetrician gynecologist. So, <laughs> I, I, I was just, we were just talking about some story ideas for season two, and, and I was on the phone with Z. So in, in the show, we made my dad run a restaurant, because both our dads are doctors, so it was, seemed like a bump. But, <laughs> but, but there was a thing where we were talking about, you know, uh, like when we were kids, sometimes we would shadow our dads for school projects or follow them around with rounds. And um, you know, when I did it with my dad, it was like, uh, you can't come in for this appointment. Uh, you can't come in for this appointment. You can't come in for that because he was just looking at a ton of vaginas. <laughs> that was his job. So anyway, um, yeah, they were pretty supportive, and and, and I think I, I got to give it up for my parents. Man. They, 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 I'm sure, were terrified, but when I told them I just want to write jokes for a living, they were like, yeah, well, I mean, we're not really going to help you do that, but we'll let you try. Because that's kind of, I mean, honestly, it was like, that's why they came to this country, is so your kids can do whatever crazy thing they want. Um, well, like, with the, like, the landscape of television and how long things take to get, take to get made, how long did it take for Master of None to get to be a full, like, blown project? Like, when did you and Aziz, like, when did you guys have the idea, like, in 1998 or something? Yeah. <laughs> we were two small Indian and Asian children, tell, yeah, commuting across the country for meetings. We were on AOL I Am. <laughs> um, no, it actually was a long process. And, and the reason for that wasn't necessarily the slow mechanics of TV development. It was more that we were working on Parks and Recreation together, and as always happened with that show, we didn't know whether it was coming back. Yeah. So this was 2013, actually. So it, it was kind of long ago. Yeah. And so Aziz and I met. We were like, we want to do a show together. We really like working together. Um, and we went and pitched it. And we went and pitched it. And it was pretty different from what it ended up being. Okay. Yeah, I, to be honest, it was a much more conventional show. It was still people in their 30s hanging out, but it was more similar to a lot of the other shows that you might see, even network shows, stuff like that, where it's, it's dating and it's a little bit of his work and stuff. And so we sold it to Netflix in, in 2013, and at the time, they they had like two shows. They had like House of Cards and Orders of the New Black, and they didn't have anything else. So we were really excited, it was going to be one of their first comedies, and then Parks and Rec got picked up. So we did another season of Parks, and what that gestation period allowed us to do was really blow up the idea of what the show could be and in retrospect was really, really valuable because we were shooting season seven of Parks and on the weekends of season I would meet all the time, just talk, talk, talk about episode ideas. And one of the episodes, one of the ideas that really crystallized what the show was, was this one, where I was in a hotel room with Aziz in New York, I think we were just in New York, in New York for some reason, and we were talking about what the show could be, and I started telling the story, not even as a show idea pitch, but just, talking about how grateful I was, I was like, yeah, look man, whatever ends up happening, like, you know, my dad grew up in a hut in a small village called Tiger Tail in Taiwan and didn't have enough food to eat and had to kill his pet chicken for dinner. <laughs> whatever happens to me at this point, it's great. Like, you know, it just, and he was like, holy shit, let's just put that in the show. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's kind of a good idea. So we walked around New York and, and came up with a lot of the bones of that episode like that day. And this was months before we started a writer's room or any of that. So, so that's kind of a long answer for saying, I mean, front to back, two years before it aired. I mean, a lot, a long time. Long time. Where, was a, were there any other network shows that were interested in it, or was it like straight up like Netflix? It was, you know, I'll spare you the boring details, but we pitched to some of the premium places, you know, the, the, the sort of, yeah. we never pitched it to a network because we just didn't feel like it was a networky yeah. show. We wanted to do weird experimental stuff, and we wanted to challenge what a show like this could be, so. Um, and Netflix came hard, they gave us a straight to series order, we never did a pilot, and we, yeah, they just let us do what we wanted, it was crazy. <laughs> and it worked out. It worked out very yeah, well. Yeah, it it's alright. Yeah, it's alright. Yeah. It's okay. Let's take, let's drink, let's drink! <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, thanks guys. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, you mentioned the chicken uh, in, the, in this episode, and this parents episode, like you said, it kind of crystallized what the show's about. And it's like, and it, it um, how does it, like, how else does it reflect your own personal lives, um, around your relationship with your parents, and all that good stuff? 
Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, there are elements of this guy's character that are based on me, <laughs> such as going to the park and reading NBA trade rumors. That's definitely something I do. No, it's really something that you might do too. We actually ended up, so it was such a great coup to get Kelvin because, like me, he's a Taiwanese American comedy writer who grew up in Southern California. And how many, I mean, there aren't that many actors in the world like that. And he happens to be really good, so it was really lucky to get him. But yeah, the show is so personal. That all we want to do is put stories that have happened to us on the screen and sort of format them into interesting ideas and, and, and the way to communicate those ideas and emotions often with real stories. I mean, there's stuff you put in there that is not my life. You know, I'm sure you can. Yeah, uh, the thing about the water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ting ting thing was yeah. a, comedy, a comedy part, but my father did grow up with water buffalo. And so, uh, which is crazy that he now has a car that talks to him, and, you know, uh, and he did uh, come to America in the '60s, he went to Mississippi State. Uh, so he's in his five foot four <laughs> in the morning. And, uh, I think his, his uh, I'm just gonna paint a picture of my dad for you. Yeah. He's like 106. His, his passport's at 106 pounds, five foot four. So um, he said when he got to the airport, they. He was like, a, it wasn't even, he was like a little brontosaurus was walking down the street. Like, people were looking at him like, what is that? <laughs> How does that work? Like, what, and um, so his life experience, and when I say he tried to, you know, sort of inhibit me from acting, it was with no malice. It was just, like, there's no, there was no path forward visible. It, it was like a Lewis and Clark thing. It's like, well, where are you going? What, what, what is that? Uh, not to overstate my experience, but that was pretty close to his experience, you know, when, uh, so he's a guy in the 60s at Mississippi State looking the way he does, and I'm an Asian American actor trying to do something where I have very few, if any, uh, role models to aim for, you know, to guide close to. So in some ways, I think that uh, when I, and I'll tell it from my perspective, when I got the script, I couldn't believe that somebody would, would have written something. It, it, I don't, again, I don't want to overstate it. I know there's like documentaries about like honor killings and stuff. <laughs> Keep it all in. We're doing great. But, uh, when, uh, when I read it, I was like, you know, geez, this is uh, so acutely uh, bullseye to my experience and to, and I think the experience of being, uh, there's a lot of Asian people here, like your relationship to your parents, and uh, to me, is such an internal experience. I don't think anyone would tell Alan and Aziz was able to put that into a narrative that was fun to watch. You know, like, so, the first and foremost, it's funny, and then it's also, there's a little medicine in there. So, I was really grateful to be, to be part of it. Cool. So, you guys go pick up for season two. Uh, oh, we're wow. super excited. Um, and, bonus, you guys got the Critics' Choice Award. Which was pretty awesome. Um, and now, I think you know what I'm thinking it. Oh, when you accept it, um, do you mind if I read what you said? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, you said, uh, what, where, uh, about the straight white guys dominating, you think the straight guys, white guys dominating uh, the industry and the movies and TV so hard for so long so that stories about anyone else seem kind of fresh and original now. Um, <laughs> was, I definitely that was like, that was a moment. Everyone got woke, as the kids say, right? <laughs> um, was that off the cuff, or was that like, you were, that was like lock and loaded, you're all, I want to say this, I'm sorry. Oh, it's not the same as stuff. Yeah, we're not supposed to swear up here, because I don't know. Swear, but... What's the policy? I mean, we will just not. I'll avoid it. Oh, vaginas. Yeah. Oh, you said vaginas. That's a medical term. <laughs> Was that locked and loaded in your head, or were you just like, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, don't make me say it. I, I, didn't, I honestly didn't think it would be particularly incendiary. I mean, like, you know, it, it's funny too, because I, I had thought, I basically like, man, there's a small chance that we might win, so I think I had thought of it, but not very much before walking up there. Like, you know, I had, I had, a, had a couple of vodka sodas, so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was crazy, man, because also, like, you're there, and, like, you're looking at Matt Damon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
BB-8 <laughs> and Matt Damon were there. <laughs> I mean, but it, you know, yeah, together. together. So, so it was real scandalous because that dude's married. Um, you know, um, yeah, so, you know, that's the thing is like, it, it, it was actually a conversation I was having a few days ago with Mike Schur, who's a producer on this show, and, you know, he created Parks and Rec, and I worked with him for a long time. And we were talking about, I think I said that same thing to him basically, because, you know, it's, I don't think it's malicious. I think it's like, look, those white guys are fuck, or, sorry, <laughs> those, white guys, those white guys are amazing, and, you know, they're great. But like, all these great, all these directors and writers, are, they, they've done amazing things, but because they honestly, like, dominated stuff, now other things are seeping in, and, and this is a thing I've said before, but, man, what a crazy year in 2015 where, there were three huge reboots, Mad Max, Creed, and Star Wars, and they starred a woman, a black guy, and a woman and a black guy. Like, that's so <laughs> amazing. Like, that's what they can do. Imagine that. Like, that's so for us, guys. Wow. Now, and, and I think there's a reason why audience, those were all, those were three huge hits for a variety of reasons, but, but, um, people are responding to that because the granular details of who a character are or who a character is um, really really sells it, and that's often the, the 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 main ingredient in making something original. And when those details, you know, have to do with that person's gender or sexuality or race, it feels newer. It feels newer. So so it, it's just you know I I, I I stand by that statement. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> make it into a shirt. Sell it. <laughs> So now, now comes the portion of the show where we ask the audience questions. So there's a mic in the middle, in the aisle. You see it? Form a cue. Don't be shy, guys. You know you guys got some questions out there. Yeah, girl. Get it. Get it. Are you going to... Don't be, don't be stereotypical shy Asians. Form a huge line. I don't want everyone yelling. Yeah, yeah. Say your name. Don't be boring. Be, be, be awesome. Be funny. <laughs> Say your name and where you're from and your favorite color. I don't know. Just sit. Okay. Hi. Is this working? I don't... Is the, is the mic on? Is it? Mm, how do you turn uh, it on? Oh. What did you do? Technical problems. <laughs> oh, we, we can hear you. Can I just... Yeah, yeah, I'll, just, yeah, I'll, just, yeah I'll, I'll just project. Yeah. You got you got um, cool hair. That's true. You got green yeah. hair, so... Yeah. <laughs> Everyone look at her? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I Oh, I think it's working. Yeah! Yeah! Yay! Um, first of all, I love the show. Um, and we were, you guys have been talking about how this was a really personal project for everyone involved. Um, I feel like whenever, well, because there are so few Asian stories being told right now on television, um, whenever something like Master Done comes along, people either really, like it really resonates with them, so I mean, that was my experience, or sometimes people um, tend to be disappointed when it doesn't perfectly match up with their experiences. So my question is, and since both of you are writers, um, how do you deal with that sort of pressure and how do you make sure it doesn't get in the way of your creative process? Uh, that's a very incisive question, thank you. Um, it's, it's good. Uh, so I think, I think it's a very legitimate question and I think what we're trying to do on the show is just be as emotionally honest and truthful to our own experiences as possible. And there's no way you can represent everyone's experience there's no way you can, in one show, encapsulate the vast variety of what it needs to be Asian or to be a black lesbian or to be a six foot five, three hundred pound dude. And we're just trying to do one version of all those characters, right? So, um, and the answer to me, I was just talking about this with you right before. We we got four hundred shows on TV now, so there should be thirty Asian shows. There should be ninety quote unquote show starring you know show starring black people. There should be a hundred shows starring Latino people, and then and only and then are we going to get something closer to what white people have had for decades, which is there's all kinds of white characters, right? And that way your show doesn't have to be the bulwark and just be the only representation, the monolithic representation of a culture. So, so the answer is more shows, and I think do whatever is true to you, because no one can deny that that's some truthful representation of somebody's life, right? It's tricky when you become the poster child for diversity. You know, like, we don't want that. We don't want that. And there, I think there's an innate humility to Master of None. It doesn't pose itself. It's not called, like, ethnics. Or Nobody's watching The Martian, like, Matt Damon, like, the white guys don't go to Mars? Like, yeah, he's not, like, yeah, yeah. all white guys. Yeah. 
just because he went to Mars, all white guys go to Mars. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but he says something that it's somehow a spokesperson for the Indian community. Yeah. So, but they, they are laser focused on that experience and also on the Taiwanese experience. Uh, he's not saying things about Korean Americans in the show because the character's not Korean American. So, I think it helps to, to, and then as long as it resonates with you, I think that's your final litmus test. Um, at the end of the day, if somebody hates you on Twitter, you can't. It, if you didn't overreach, then yeah. you know they're going to hate you on Twitter. So, but it's a great question. I think uh, I think they're they're handling it really well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Say your name. Where are you from? I'm Robin Hi. from San Francisco. Uh, Hi, Robin. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for the show. It's so refreshing to see people of color and such good storylines. Um, my question is, is how hard was it coming up in this business, being a person of color, um, how hard was it to make it in this business and have you encountered a lot of um, you know, racism or prejudice? And also, what were your thoughts on the Asian jokes at the Oscars? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll handle the first part too, uh, first. Um, uh, you know, it took a long time before I even reflected on what my experiences were in the writer's room, and I was very spoiled. I was on the loveliest show possible, Parks and Rec. I was on that show for seven years. Yeah. 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 I've been a big fan of that show also, which was a life highlight. Um, but but uh, so that writer's room was great because, again, uh, Mike I mentioned earlier uh, was the co-creator of that show. And he was very, very, very diligent, very, very conscientious about doing the best he could to hire a diverse writer's room. And um, that show was often a 50% female writing staff, which was great. Um, you know, we had we had various people of color, all you know, all sorts. And um, that being said, I had never written with another Asian person <laughs> until this show. <laughs> so, I mean, that's like a decade of writing. And they're just, oh, look, man, like, in terms of Asian comedy writers in Hollywood, you're looking at, like, 40% of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, uh, so if our plane goes down tomorrow, we are on you, but, uh, but, but it just, so it takes time, it takes time, and I wouldn't even say, I have an experience of prejudice, it's more like, man, and this didn't come up for me that often at parks, but, yeah, if you're the only Asian dude, and then something about, it, like, for instance, something about the Asian jokes of the Oscars come up, everyone looks at you and you're like, you have to, you're the only one. And you know, my, my old roommate, Aisha Muhar, uh, was another writer on Parks. And it was the same thing, it was like, is the, well, oh, we're gonna make a joke that might be, you know, might be offensive to black people. Well, how, how about it, Aisha? Like, what do you say? Like, well, that's not how to speak for everybody. So the more people you get, even if there's two people, three people, like, the more, the more it becomes uh, normal or sort of, the representation is fuller, the less you feel that onus on you to speak for everybody. Because I don't want to speak for everybody. That's insane. Um, you handled the Oscar one. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Everyone knows what the Oscar joke is, right? Yeah, you guys are aware. Yeah. Uh, this girl's nodding, but shaking her head. Yo, when it comes down next time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Take care of it. Tell her. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hold on one second. She's going to figure out what I'm doing. You're done. You're good. Pull up the clip. <laughs> that Chris Rock is one of the funniest people on the planet, yeah. if not the funniest. Um, I think the, the disappointment, at least for me, was that there weren't more Asian jokes. So was, <laughs> I wish there was six. Um, the problem is there was one, and it wasn't funny. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the real problem for me. If you make me laugh, but you somehow offend me, but I laughed, you got me somehow. It's, a, it's like an internal indicator that you, got, you, you nailed some truth. And these guys, you know, the, the Louis C.K.'s, the Chris Rock's, the top, the cream of the crop, they're, they're like tennis players. They're aiming for the line. They're aiming for the corner. So I understand if they miss it by a little. That's fine. But that was a weak joke. That was a, like a 19, that was a 60 year old stereotype about. And it wasn't even that clear when they showed it. <laughs> so I, I think my only disappointment is that one of, you know, both of our comedic idols. But you know what? It speaks to something else. And I'll, I'll say this like, it speaks to a little bit of opacity about what is funny about Asian people, or like, I don't think it's that clear. Even Chris Rock, even one of the funniest people on the planet, doesn't quite know how to nail us. 
And, uh, and I think that's the thing. It's like they say about actors, like it's a really, it's a good thing if you're impersonatable. You know, if, if you're Pacino or if you're walk-in. Because it means that people understand your rhythms or, their, or they can, you know, if you've gotten in their skin. As, as a general model that as an Asian community, I don't know that people quite know what we're all about. Or what's funny. Like we're not, you know, it's not a clean scan. So that was kind of interesting to me. It's like we're good at math was the best they could come up with in six months of like 15 writers at the top of their game. We're good at math. Okay, moving on. Let's bring it up. She has Sophia Vergara's boobs. So I, you know that, that that's my take on it. I was disappointed in how unfunny it was. Can I ask another question? Oh okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of gender and people of color is your own production? Uh, it's, it's pretty diverse, man. I think it's that thing where they did a study, uh, you know, when there's a female director, the crew is just naturally more female. It's just like, you, you, start, seeing, you start seeing people, right? So, look, our writer's room last year was, was really diverse. I mean, it was gender-wise um, and Asian people-wise. <laughs> And and, and uh, this this year we're we're probably going to rotate a lot of writers in and out. What we want is these interesting, unique stories, and we care, man. We really care, and, and I think we've sort of put that out there. And agents are submitting us diverse writers. Agents are submitting us people with interesting stories. Um, Crew-wise, you know, yeah. I mean, we definitely we care about we definitely care about that stuff. And again, we don't want to be seen like he said as the poster child, like this is the diverse show. It's more like, you know, we want to make the best show possible and we feel like those stories are not being told as much and let's tell them, you know. You have another question? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here! You had your time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank great. you, Ross. Hello, sir. What's your name? Where uh, are you from? My name is Andrew Wong. Uh, represent Wong Clan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all the Chinese people. <laughs> And I come from Modesto, California. All right. Oh, man. Big ups to Modesto. Uh, you guys have trumped. That is way worse. <laughs> I know. There was, there was uh, four Asian kids in my high school. I was the only Chinese one. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, even though I look Filipino. But, uh... <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. you're just ripping. <laughs> I would like to first say thank you so much for making this show. It's really awesome. And I know this episode in particular, when I first watched it, I felt a lot of guilt. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's what we want. But, uh, you know, and I, I felt a lot of guilt because I related, because I am the first child to, uh, you know, Chinese immigrants. Uh, but I actually, I have a question for you two more personally. Um, since you two, um, I believe you said you're also both children of immigrants. Um, Having that experience and having maybe your parents not tell you you're, they're proud of you that often, how is that going to affect how you treat your children, how you raise them? Whatever, children, never mind. Get away from me. Next question. Yeah, I think they're, in Los Angeles in particular, I think, uh, I'll stereotype, there, there's like a per permissive kind of. Uh, uh, trend right now, like a lot of Hollywood liberals, you know, uh, are frequently don't tell their kids no, or they want their kids to experience. Uh, I think, based on my parents' philosophy, life is mostly no. <laughs> so I don't know why I would want my kid to not hear no until he was like 14. Uh, so uh, I do think uh, I do think there's a balance. I think there's a balance. I think I'll speak only for myself. Um, do you think I'm driven by a sense of uh, uh, internal guilt, uh, internal Asian um, <laughs> shame? You're looking at a guy who left high school a year early to go to Harvard. Like, oh, <laughs> they're, 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 you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> all your parents just their eyes just open. <laughs> All, all of us are like, damn, my parents are right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no matter what Alan was going to do, he was going to see that. And he's, he's been, and, and, and my brother and myself, we're high-achieving 
that makes my brother more than I. Um, but but it, it's an internal engine, and it might not run on the healthiest fuel. <laughs> um, I saw some cheesy BuzzFeed thing about um, Asian people trying to figure out last time their parents said, I love you. Oh, and, um, <laughs> and it's like, it's just, like really painful. It's like legit. It's just a super cut of people looking up at the ceiling. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know said it. dinner with my ex-girlfriend's parents, by the end of dinner they had hugged me more times than like, you know, <laughs> That's based on a real story. <laughs> so I, I think that there's got to be um, a safe place where your kids know that there's unconditional love, but I don't think it's that safe. <laughs> and they, I think they have to, I think, you know what, I'll take that back. I think kids feel more safe within boundaries for, for me. You know, um, they know, but when they don't have boundaries, that shit crazy. <laughs> so so that, that's my take. I think we, we can, world, the world can be a more sport of influences. I can take things from my Taiwanese culture and heritage. I can take things from living in Los Angeles, California, and put them all together into a nice burrito of yeah. heritage. Yeah. 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 Always better in a burrito. Burrito. Thank you for the question. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Wow, you guys are brilliant with the question. Yours better be good. Hi. So your name and where you're from? You can um, speak a lot. My name is Ezra. I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska. And, um, Whoa, Alaska Asian, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, there must not be many of you there. <laughs> There's a lot of racism there. Oh, cool. <laughs> And admittedly, my question is selfish because I wanted to be an actor since I since I was in high school. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering. You want a job? That's not the question. But the no, question is, um, what is the future for like Asian American actors or Asian American aspiring actors, um, like who who perhaps aren't like conventionally beautiful or like funny in a specific way, or maybe they're not even like into martial arts. Like, to the context, like, Wait, you're not? <laughs> you don't want to be like, you find like karate yet? <laughs> uh, to give you more context, um, like, Bruce Lee is one of my personal heroes, and not just because, like, he kicks people's asses. Like, but, hey, hey, language. Uh, he kicks people's butts very hard. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he took strong... So he took strong roles and he was able to contribute an Asian American image to the cultural imagination uh, in a meaningful way. And so he, and I think he did a great job with that. But he's also really into martial arts and so um, that's, I think, one of the things we get pegged at. So like, uh, he's really good at martial arts, Calvin is an actor, but he's like a beautiful man. And like, <laughs> And, and Aziz, he's, he's not a model, but he's funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Is, uh, you guys that last guy should have like a stand-up. <laughs> Let's turn this panel into a battle. <laughs> yeah, my, my point is like, um, is there a space for like, normal people? <laughs> Here's, here's my short answer. Uh, we're working on it. We're working on it, and, and I think more and more, it's a process. We've got to get Asian writers, Asian creators, Asian directors, Asian producers, uh, and the more we prove that our stuff can also be good, the more we'll be able to cast Asian people, the more diversity in terms of roles. I don't mean that in terms of racial diversity. I mean exactly what you're saying. In terms of, we need Asian leads. We need Asian. We need like you know an Asian gym on the office. We don't need to go out to side characters all the time. The lead gets to do this stuff. The lead gets to have, make, have changes happen in his or her life. The lead dates people. You know, we we had you know I would always say to my friend in college, you know, he was black. He's like, we need better black representation in movies. I was like, I totally agree. I totally agree. When was the last time you saw an Asian man kiss a woman in a show <laughs> or movie? And at the time, you know, this was 10, 15 years ago, the answer was zero. And in the past 10 years, okay, we got Harold and Harold Kumar, and we got like, that one dude in Fast and Furious that they kiss a lady once. <laughs> it ain't happening, man. So that's like partly why, you know, we had Kelvin be like a ladies' man in the show. And 
also based on my real life. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had, it, it's gonna take time, you know, so I had read a pilot years ago that was about a father and son, and I made it white people, because I was like, man, who's gonna cast this show? Who's gonna be in it? And it's, over time, we, we need to gain that confidence and, 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 and come up with, again, like I said, there's 400 shows. We just gotta make more and more and more, and I think you're right. I want to see, I never saw anyone like me on the screen growing up. Never. Uh, you, you, have, you have some insight into this. As a working actor for years, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, I'll say really quick. Um, yeah. There's one woman right now who I think you can put on a poster and open the movie, and that's Melissa McCarthy. Yeah. And so I don't understand why every girl in LA wants to look exactly, all their butts are like this big, <laughs> and like they have the exact same highlights, and, and there's literally, there's a poster of Melissa McCarthy like sliding across the floor in front of June Law, and I'm like, that's, why don't they all want to look like that? It doesn't make sense to me. That's a movie star. I, yeah, that's a movie star. So I think when you are number one on the call sheet, when you're the Aziz or the Melissa McCarthy, people live in your experience. and. They, they overestimate beauty. I think, or the general public overestimates beauty. Jack Nicholson is not handsome. He never was. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But he's well, so, are like so much more interesting, interesting <laughs> than him. So I, I think uh, aesthetic, being aesthetically busy, if you just walk around Silver Lake or Venice, <laughs> you know, you throw a rock and you'll hit somebody. That's also, go for it, man. man. Just go be an actor. Just do yeah, it. just go be an actor. Do it. Oh. All right, Please. thanks, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Regarding to like the future generation of diverse Asian actors, um, I'm a huge fan of the show. I binge watch it when I do my homework. Um, but I know just uh, I go to an art school, and the first thing I heard as soon as this show dropped was all the Asian kids. They were super excited because they were super inspired, like the theater department, because there's not a lot of Asian actors. So they're super inspired because it gives them like the hope that they can also be a main character and not just a side character that's just there for laughs. So how does it make you feel that you guys are really inspiring like the next generation of diverse actors? Uh, I'm like, te I'm literally tearing up right now. I was like, that's like, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. That just means so much. And, and, and I want to, I just want, if, if that's actually happening, that's great. I, I want people to, to, I want Asian people to be creative and, and do as many different things as possible, you know? I, I, like, I want more characters in movies who look like you and have awesome hair and have headphones on and like go to art school, you know? Like, let's, it, it, it just means a lot, right? It's like, you know, I, I went to college, I majored in biology, because I was like, I don't know what I'm, and then doing this, it's like, I just feel like our community needs to do as much interesting stuff as possible and creative stuff and be leaders and like be CEOs also. Like, it's not just, you know, let's not just grind all the time. <laughs> let's, let, let's do interesting new things. I, I'm very touched by that. No, I, I, um, I think it might be a little anathema to, like, and I'm now I'll stereotype about our, myself and my own heritage, but to, like, put yourself forward as much as you need to, plus there's some kind of numbering. Um, but it gets easier, and maybe it's just a mob mentality. Like, if I start looting, maybe you'll start looting. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you'll all start looting. We can just Trump rally this thing, but, like, <laughs> but, but, but I, I, there is that kind of, like, uh, you know, Grease the wheels of it all, and, and, and I think there's, there's got to be some kind of saturation point where enough people are doing that. It's a viable uh, path forward for people like yourself. And we all know, like, crazy talented, crazy intelligent Asian Americans that are somewhere in a room trying to figure out whether or not they can, this is a real job, or you know, whether it's acting, or writing, or directing, or producing. And so um, it means a lot that this, I mean, it's, it wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah, no. They're just trying to tell a story, I think. 
So, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Where you're from and your favorite Asian actor. No. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is AJ and I'm white, so who cares where I'm from? <laughs> where? Oh, oh. We love you, we love white people. <laughs> they need all the best stuff. <laughs> I'm from Tulare, California. Where? Exactly! <laughs> That's also why I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> Uh, you uh, had said that the show Master Nun is heavily uh, based off um, your own life, Aziz's own life, your writer's own life. Uh, what would you say is um, the difference between making a story that's um, completely made up stories versus very autobiographical? And what would you say about um, seeing more maybe autobiographical things on TV? Uh, good question. I think that there's something intangible and magical about using those real facts and details and it's something that you can't describe but somehow it just feels more real when it comes from a real place and what we're trying to get across with every one of these episodes is an essential feeling or idea or a emotion that we've talked about and then we want to build an episode around that feeling so in parents it was both the guilt and honesty that we felt, but also the how lucky we are and how we don't appreciate the struggles that our parents, whether they're immigrants or whoever they are, went through in order for us to have these great lives. And when you're writing from an emotional place that you yourself really recognize, the, the writing's gonna be stronger, I think. And and that's not to say that you can't make stuff up out of whole cloth, but, but to me, on a show like this that is pretty grounded and pretty um, uh, hopefully relatively realistic. I think whenever you can use real details, it's just, you just, like the Nashville episode, if you guys saw that one, that's based on a real thing that happened to one of our writers. A guy asked her out on a first date and said, are the chief flights to Nashville, let's just go. And so, which is insane. By the way, her date went really poorly. The guy was too cheap to get a hotel room and they had to walk around all night. And, uh, get on a plane back to wherever they were living. But, but you know, they, something about it, you know, the audience can watch and it just feels real. And I think, I think that's the simplest way of saying it. And, and the best, a lot of the best stuff in a, in a personal comedy like this is the real stuff. You have anything to add to this? No. <laughs> He's basically saying I said it all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I find that it's very productive. Thank you. My name is Rishi, and I'm actually also from Riverside. No way, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, that's why I moved here. Uh, it's great cool. right to Polly. Yeah, Polly High School. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just a uh, fun fact about Riverside Polly High School, the kids who were in the Dan Daniel video also attend yeah. Riverside Polly High School. <laughs> <laughs> Me and them. You can all move down there and raise your kids down there. <laughs> So in one of the episodes, they talk about how if there's, uh, there's going to be two Indian actors in the show, and that we can't do that because it's an Indian show. Uh, is that something you guys have heard working in Hollywood around whether there's going to be one more than one or two minorities in a show or a movie? Oh, too many Asian people. Uh, that's something Aziz thought. Like, we, we, we were arguing about it. He was on the executive side for a long time. I was like, you're crazy, man. He was like, well, listen. We're, we're, they're trying to make money, right? They're trying to make it like if you did the Hangover and there were two Indian guys. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't want to see that. Looks like an Indian movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, You're crazy, right? but so you, a reasonable person can't think that. And and yes, but I, I was like, dude, two Indian people are as different as two people of any. It's just, it, as we showed, hopefully partially in that episode. At the end, it was very intentional to have three Indian friends in the last shot, and they couldn't be more different. They're three very different people. They're not just Indian. They're they're people with characters. So so absolutely, it's a thing where I think, yeah. I mean, you have you gone through this in casting? It, it's crazy. Yeah. So I just I just went through it. There was the show, and they wanted to go Asian with the male with the male. <laughs> <laughs> The guy will be white. Yeah. Like, it's almost like, you know, <laughs> if then. And um, I kind of agree with Z's a little bit. <laughs> like, I mean, I get it. there's 
one blonde One Direction guy, and then there's one long hair in One Direction. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> there's not two blondes in One Direction. <laughs> TV should look like One Direction. <laughs> <laughs> if like everybody on Sunday was bald and overweight, that would be, you know, so, uh, no, but I, I understand it from a, you know, a mass uh, appeal kind of thing. The, the, the big difference now is that TV's less and less in mass appeal. Uh, so, on, on a certain kind of show, that would make more sense. But, <clears throat> I, you know, generally speaking, and we were talking about this during the show, I used to, when, when I used to go out on a lot of, uh, I killed a lot of my wives on TV shows. Like, Are you kidding? Because like, um, like, every season, you know, they do 22, so CSI will do one Hispanic episode, and one very special Chinese episode. <laughs> and the Chinese episode, God bless their hearts, is always written by somebody who's not Chinese, and so they just go for the low-hanging fruit, and it's like a guy who killed his wife because she was like on the internet too much. <laughs> You know, ate his yogurt that he would have made. <laughs> <laughs> like, just kill her. And then, like, at the end, like on page 51, I have to freak out and tell like Anthony LaPaglia why I did it because she shamed our family. <laughs> and at some point, you, you hit a fever pitch. You're like, God damn, these people think that we just kill each other. <laughs> um, and, and I guess so. Uh, and then that that goes back to what you were saying about writing and. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that I want a room of 12 white people writing an Asian uh, show. You know what I mean? Because so, then diversity becomes a mandate. And then they don't, they don't know what they're doing. So diversity happens not in casting. Diversity happens in, in the batter, you know, when, when they cook in it. So I think the writer's room is where people need to be looking at diversity. But anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. But thanks yeah, for definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we might see you one more guy. I'm sorry. You guys, are you guys gonna tag team this Make it good. <laughs> Wait, did you just cut it for a second? Yeah, you did. Yeah, so, uh, I can speak right after me, but I feel very passionate about this and I have a question. Whoa! Oh, no. This is, okay guys, it's not the Hunger Games. <laughs> why, don't we, hey, why don't we just take both? Let's just yeah, let's just do both. Let's just take both. We'll take let's just do both, guys. Why don't you, why don't you let the, why don't you let, you're all good, get on let, let the young lady go and then we'll, we'll take your question too. Yeah. Well, thanks for calling me young. <laughs> and your name? My name is Lila, and I'm from New York. Woo! All right, girl! Um, you know, this episode in particular really touched me. I'm first-generation American, and I have those kinds of difficulties talking to my parents about their stories. I don't really want to talk about it. So I'm wondering, when you were doing readings and when you were in production, if... Um, you know, if there were any, if there was camaraderie around the actual, you know, content of this episode. Absolutely, it was a, it was a real favorite, I think, of the crew, and um, it was great. We had our, one of our steady cam operators, Rod Clarko, is a white guy, but he said, this, he's like, this is my favorite episode. He said, this wasn't my parents' story, but it was my grandparents' story. They're Polish immigrants, you know, or, you know and it, it just, it's not on, on some level. It's not about being Asian. It's not being about. It's not even about being immigrants. It's about sacrifices and your parents grew up in Detroit or whatever it's still the same thing it's like man life was hard life was hard and you know some of us we have lives that are so much easier so it, it was a real favorite thing. I don't know if you have anything to add to, add to that yeah. yeah I mean I, I would I would agree that it's not necessarily about <laughs> Indian Americans or Taiwanese Americans I, I think it touches people because they were at number two on the list and I think People, from what my experience of talking to people, they weren't expecting that. Like, the first episode is hilarious, and it's about uh, a love relationship, and then you hit the second episode, and I think people were really, it took a left turn in a way, and it cracked people's brains open. So I think it was a really welcome surprise to see that Alan and Aziz were going a lot deeper with the series. So, yeah. Thanks for the Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Spencer, and I was born and raised in the Bay Area. First of all, let me start off with saying you guys have created a fantastic piece of art. It is a great show, so funny. It's so true. <clears throat> Kelvin, you mentioned, the first thing you said was that you think white people have made it easy to be interesting because Asians just aren't given the limelight. And I'm not saying it's not true, that we're not, but we're not just novelties. 
The reason I think that your show is so powerful is that you've managed to reach us on the emotional level that you spoke of. <clears throat> You're willing to address the issues that there are wrong things in Asian society too. That we can't express love between parent <clears throat> and child because we're worried about being judged because we place our love on accept. We judge our love based on how much success we have. There are so many children and adults now that can't be the real, the real selves around their parents because they're so afraid of being judged. And it's a problem on both sides of the spectrum. It's not one person's fault. It's a miscommunication that people have forgotten how to love each other, even their parents and children. <clears throat> when we have to lie to say I love you and make an excuse to be busy, <clears throat> there's a problem with that society. I draw, I'm proudly Asian American. It's taken me 22 years to come, come into my own. and draw, I can draw strength and power and acceptance for my culture. But there are wrong things with it. And when you say things like, yeah, it's interesting because all every white person is already an actor, and so it's easy to be an Asian new person. Maybe. But you can speak hate, or you can preach love. And whatever you say is going to influence a lot of people in the way they think. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have the answer is no.
Yeah, it was crazy, man. Because also, like, you're there and, like, you're looking at Matt Damon. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, BBA and Matt Damon were there. So, I mean, but it, you know, yeah, together. together so it was real scandal because that dude's married. Um, no, um, yeah, so, you know, that's the thing is, like, it, it, it was actually a conversation I was having a few days ago with Mike Schur. It's on you to speak for everybody because I don't want to speak for everybody. That's insane. Um, you handled the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Everyone knows what the Oscar joke is, right? Yeah, you guys are aware. Yeah. Uh, this girl's not in the chain. Yo, when they come I'll down next week. Okay, yeah. <laughs> take care of her. Tell her. Go ahead. Hold on one second. She's going to figure out what I'm doing. You're done. You're good. Pull up the clip. Pull up the clip. Pull up the clip. Bye bye. Um, uh, we talked about it a little, so, uh, but I think uh, we agree that Chris Rock is. One of the funniest people on the planet, if yeah. not the funniest. Um, I think the, the disappointment, at least for me, was that there weren't more Asian jokes. So was, <laughs> I wish there was six. Um, the problem is there was one, and it wasn't funny. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the real problem for me. If you make me laugh, but you somehow offend me, but I laughed, you got it somehow. It's, a, it's like an internal indicator that you got, you, you nailed some truth. And these guys, you know, the, the Louis C.K.'s, the Chris Rock's, the top, the cream of the crop, they're, they're like tennis players. They're aiming for the line. They're aiming for the corner. So I understand if they miss it by a little. That's fine. But that was a weak joke. That was a, like a 19, that was a 60-year-old stereotype about. And it wasn't even that clear when the joke was. So I, I think my only disappointment is that one of, you know, both of our comedic idols. But you know what? It speaks to something else, and I'll, I'll say this. Like, it speaks to a little bit of opacity about what is funny about Asian people, or like, I don't think it's that clear. Even Chris Rock, even one of the funniest people on the planet, doesn't quite know how to nail us. And, uh, and I think that's the thing, it's like, they say about actors, like, it's a really, it's a good thing if you're impersonatable. You know, if, if you're Pacino, or if you're walk-in, because it means that people understand your rhythms, or, they're, or they can, you know, you've gotten in their skin. As, as a general model that as an Asian community, I don't know that people quite know what we're all about and what's funny. Like, we're not, you know, it's not a clean scan. So that was kind of interesting to me. It's like, we're good at math. It was the best they could come up with in six months of 15 writers at the top of their game. We're good at math. Okay, moving on. Bring it up. She has Sophia Vergara's boobs. So, you know, that, that, that's my take on it. I was disappointed in how unfunny it was. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of gender and people of color is your own production? Uh, it's, it's pretty diverse, man. I think it's that thing where they did a study, uh, you know, when there's a female director, the crew is just naturally more female. It's just like, you, you, start, seeing, you start seeing people, right? So, look, our writer's room last year was, was really diverse. I mean, it was gender-wise, um, and Asian people is just be as emotionally honest and truthful to our own experiences as possible. And there's no way you can represent everyone's experience. There's no way you can, in one show, encapsulate the vast variety of what it needs to be Asian or to be a black lesbian or to be a six foot five, 300 pound dude. And we're just trying to do one version of all those characters, right? So, um, and the answer to me, I was just talking about this with you right before, we, we got 400 shows on TV now. So there should be 30 Asian shows. There should be 90 quote unquote shows starring, you know, shows starring black people. There should be 100 shows starring Latino people. And then and only and then are we gonna get something closer to what white people have had for decades, which is there's all kinds of white characters, right? And that way your show doesn't have to be the bulwark and just be the only representation, the monolithic representation of a culture. So, so the answer is more shows and I think do whatever is true to you because no one can deny that that's some truthful representation of somebody's life, right? Yeah, it's tricky when you become the poster child for diversity. You know, like, we don't want that. We don't want that. And there, I think there's an innate humility to Master of None. It doesn't pose itself. It's not called, like, ethnics. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> <laughs> watching The Martian like, Matt Damon, like, the white guys don't go to Mars? Like, yeah, he's not, like, yeah, yeah. all white guys, yeah. just because he went to Mars.
Mars, all white guys go to Mars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> he says something that it's somehow a spokesperson for the Indian community. Yeah. So, but they, they are laser focused on that experience and also the Taiwanese experience. Uh, he's not saying things about Korean Americans in the show because the character's not Korean American. So I think it helps to, to, and then as long as it resonates with you, I think that's your final litmus test. Um, at the end of the day, if somebody hates you on Twitter, you can't. They, if you didn't overreach, then yeah. you know they're going to hate you on Twitter. So, but it's a great question. I think uh, I think they're they're handling it really well. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Say your name. Where are you from? I'm Robin Hi. from San Francisco. Uh, Hi, Robin. Hi. <laughs> thank you for the show. It's so refreshing to see people of color and such good storylines. Um, my question is, is how hard was it coming up in this business, being a person of color, um, how hard was it to make it in this business and have you encountered a lot of um, you know, racism or prejudice? And also, what were your thoughts on the Asian jokes at the Oscars? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll handle the first part too, uh, first. Um, uh, you know, it took a long time before I look at her. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I oh, I think it's one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, first of all, I love the show. Um, and we were, you guys have been talking about how this was a really personal project for everyone involved. Um, I feel like whenever, well, because there are so few Asian stories being told right now on television, um, whenever something like Master Done comes along, people either really like it really resonates with them, so I mean that was my experience. Or sometimes people um, tend to be disappointed when it doesn't perfectly match up with their experiences. So my question is, and since both of you are writers, um, how do you deal with that sort of pressure, and how do you make sure it doesn't get in the way of your creative process? Uh, that's a very incisive question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's good. Uh, so I think I think it's a very legitimate question, and I think what we're trying to do on the show is just be as emotionally honest and truthful to our own experiences as possible. And there's no way you can represent everyone's experience. There's no way you can, in one show, encapsulate the vast variety of what it means to be Asian or to be a black lesbian or to be a six foot five, 300 pound dude. And we're just trying to do one version of all those characters, right? So, um, and the answer to me, I was just talking about this with you right before, we, we got 400 shows on TV now. So there should be 30 Asian shows. There should be 90 quote unquote shows starring, you know, shows starring black people. There should be 100 shows starring Latino people. And then and only and then are we gonna get something closer to what white people have had for decades, which is there's all kinds of white characters, right? And that way your show doesn't have to be the bulwark and just be the only representation, the monolithic representation of a culture. So, so the answer is more shows and I think do whatever is true to you, because no one can deny that that's some truthful representation of somebody's life, right? It's tricky when you become the poster child for diversity. You know, like, we, we, <laughs> we don't want that. And we don't want that. And there, I think there's an innate humility to Master of None. It doesn't pose itself. It's not called, like, ethnics. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's watching the Mars and like Matt Damon. Like the white guys don't go to Mars. Like yeah, he's not like yeah, yeah. all white guys. Yeah. Just because he went to Mars, all white guys go to Mars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> when he says something that it's somehow a spokesperson for the Indian community. Yeah. So, but they they are laser focused on that experience and also the Taiwanese experience. Uh, he's not saying things about Korean Americans in the show because. African American. So I think it helps to, to, and then as long as it resonates with you, I think that's your final litmus test. Um, at the end of the day, if somebody hates you on Twitter, you can't. That happened to one of our writers. A guy asked her out on a first date and said, "Are there cheap flights to Nashville? Let's just go." And so, which is insane. By the way, her date went really poorly. The guy was too cheap to get a hotel room, and they had to walk around all night. You know, playing back to wherever they were living. But, but you know. They, Something about it, you know, the audience can watch and it just feels real. And I think I think that's the simplest way of saying it. And, and the best, a lot of the best stuff in a in a personal comedy like this is the real stuff. You have anything to add to this? No. Great. He's basically saying I said it all. Um, yeah, I, I find that it's very productive. Thank you. Uh, where are you from? I'm 
name is Rishi, and I'm actually also from Riverside. No way, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, that's why I moved here. Uh, it took me oh, great. Great to Poly. Yeah, Poly High School. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just a uh, fun fact about Riverside Poly High School, the kids who were in the Dan Daniel video also attend yeah. Riverside Poly High School. <laughs> <laughs> me and them. You can all move down there and raise your kids down there. <laughs> So in one of the episodes, they talk about how if there's, uh, there's going to be two Indian actors in the show, and that we can't do that because it's an Indian show. Uh, is that something you guys have heard working in Hollywood around, whether there's going to be one more than one or two minorities in a show or a movie? Oh, too many Asian people. That, that's something Aziz thought. Like, we, we, we were arguing about it. He was on the executive side for a long time. I was like, you're crazy, man. He was like, well, listen. We're, we're, they're trying to make money, right? They're trying to make it like if you did the Hangover and there were two Indian guys. <laughs> he's like, I don't want to see that. Looks like an Indian movie. <laughs> I'm like, you're crazy, man. But so you, a reasonable person can't think that. And and yes, but I, I was like, dude, two Indian people are as different as two people of any. It's just, it, as we showed, hopefully partially in that episode. At the end, it was very intentional to have three Indian friends in the last shot, yeah. and they couldn't be more different. They're three very different people. They're not just Indian. They're they're people with characters. So so absolutely, it's a thing where I think, yeah. I mean, you have you gone through this in casting? It, it's crazy. Yeah. So, I just I just went through it. There was the show, and they wanted to go Asian with the male with the male. <laughs> 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 The guy will be white. Yeah. Like, it's almost like, you know, <laughs> if then. And um, I kind of agree with Z's a little bit. <laughs> like, I mean, I get it. There's one blonde, one direction guy, and then there's one long hair in one direction. There's not two blonde, one direction. <laughs> like, no, TV should look like one direction. <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody outside of it was bald and overweight, that would be, you know, so. Uh, no, it's a cheesy BuzzFeed thing about uh, Asian people trying to figure out last time their parents said I love you. Oh, and, um, and it's like, it's just, like really painful. It's like legit. It's just a super cut of people looking up at the ceiling. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know you said it before. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and, you know, and there's that great line that Alan read, like, last time I had uh, dinner with my ex-girlfriend's parents, by the end of dinner, they had hugged me more times than my dinner. <laughs> That's based on a real story. <laughs> so, I, I think that there's got to be um, a safe place where your kids know that there's unconditional love, but I don't think it's that safe. <laughs> and they, I think they have to, I think, you know what, I'll take that back. I think kids feel more safe within boundaries. For, for me, you know, um, they know, but when they don't have boundaries, I think it's just all batshit crazy. <laughs> so so that, that's my take. I think we, we can, world, the world can be a more sport of influences. I can take things from my Taiwanese culture and heritage. I can take things from living in Los Angeles, California, and put them all together into a nice burrito of yeah. heritage. Yeah. 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 Always better in a burrito. Yeah. Uh, burrito. <laughs> cool. Thank you for the question. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Um, my name is Ezra, I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska. And, um, Whoa, Alaska Asian dude! <laughs> <laughs> Damn, there must not be many of you there. <laughs> There's a lot of racism there. Oh, cool! Thanks for the show. Uh, my question is actually... Admittedly, my question is selfish, because I wanted to be an actor since I, since I was in high school. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering... You want a job? <laughs> Sure. That's not the question, but the yeah, question is, um, what is the future for like Asian American actors or Asian American aspiring actors, um, like who, who perhaps aren't like conventionally beautiful or like funny in a specific way, or maybe they're not even like into martial arts? Like, you're not? You don't want to be like you finally karate yet? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To give you more context. Um, like Bruce Lee is one of my personal heroes, and not just because like he kicks people's asses, like but hey, hey, language. Uh, he kicks people's butts very hard. Uh, he um, he took strong 
So he took strong roles, and he was able to contribute an Asian American image to the cultural imagination uh, in a meaningful way. And so he, and I think he did a great job with that. But he's also really into martial arts, and so um, that's, I think, one of the things we get pegged at. So like, uh, he's really good at martial arts, Calvin is an actor, but he's like a beautiful man. And like, <laughs> Stories. I mean, there's stuff you put in there that is not my life. You know, I'm sure you can. Yeah, uh, the thing about the water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Ting Ting thing was yeah. a, a, comedy, a comedy part, but my father did grow up with water buffalo. And so, uh, which is crazy that he now has a car that talks to him. And, you know, uh, and he did uh, come to America in the 60s, he went to Mississippi State. Uh, so he's in his five foot four. <laughs> in the morning. And, uh, <laughs> I think his, his uh, I'm just going to paint a picture of my dad for you. Yeah. He's like 106 pounds. His, his passport's at 106 pounds, 5 foot 4. So um, he said when he got to the airport, they, he was like, a, it wasn't even, he was like a, a little brontosaurus was walking down the street. Like people were looking at him like, what is that? <laughs> How does that work? Like, what? And um, so his life experience, and when I say he tried to, you know, sort of, inhibit me from acting it was with no malice. It was just that there's no there was no path forward visible. It, it was like a Lewis and Clark thing. It's like, well where are you going? What 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 is that? Uh, not to overstate my experience, but that was pretty close to his experience, you know, when uh, so he's a guy in the sixties at Mississippi State looking the way he does and I'm an Asian American actor trying to do something where I have very few if any uh, role models to aim for, you know, to guidepost to so in some ways, I think that uh, when I, I'll tell from my perspective, when I got the script, I couldn't believe that somebody would, would have written something. It, it, I don't, again, I don't want to overstate it. I know there's like documentaries about like honor killings and stuff. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, let's keep it all in. We're doing great. But like, <laughs> when, uh, when I read it, I was like, you know, geez, this is uh, so acutely uh, bullseye. To my experience and to, and I think the experience of being, uh, there's a lot of Asian people here, like your, your relationship <laughs> to your parents and uh, to me is such an internal experience. I don't think anyone until Alan and Aziz was able to put that into a narrative that was fun to watch. You know, like so, the first and foremost, it's funny, and then it's also there's a little medicine in there. So I was really grateful to be, to be part of it. Cool. So, you guys go pick up for season two. Uh, oh, we're super excited about that. Um, and, bonus, you guys got the Critics' Choice Award. Which was pretty darn awesome. Um, and Alan, I think you know what I'm thinking about it. Uh, when you accept it, um, do you mind if I read what you said? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, uh, you said, uh, what, where, where, um, about the straight white guys dominating, you think the straight guys, white guys dominating uh, the industry and uh, movies and TV so hard. This guy's character that are based on me, <laughs> such as going to the park and reading NBA trade rumors. That's definitely something I do. No, it's really something that you might do too. We actually ended up. So it was such a great coup to get Calvin because, like me, he's a Taiwanese American comedy writer who grew up in Southern California. And how many? I mean, there aren't that many. The show is so personal. That all we want to do is put stories that have happened to us on the screen and sort of format them into interesting ideas and, and, and the way to communicate those ideas and emotions often with real stories. I mean, there's stuff you put in there that is not my life. You know, I'm sure you can. Yeah, uh, the thing about the water buffalo. <laughs> uh, the Ting Ting thing was yeah. a, comedy, a comedy part, but my father did grow up with water buffalo. And so, uh, which is crazy that he now has a car that talks to him, and, you know, uh, and he did uh, come to America in the '60s. He went to Mississippi State, uh, so he's in his five foot four <laughs> in the morning. And, uh, <laughs> I think his, his uh, I'm just gonna paint a picture of my dad for you. Yeah. He's like 106. His, his passport's at 106 pounds, five foot four. So um, he said when he got to the airport, they. He was like, a, it wasn't even, he was like a little brontosaurus was walking down the street. Like, people were looking at him like, what is that? <laughs> How does that work? Like, what, and um, 
So his life experience, and when I say he tried to, you know, sort of inhibit me from acting, it was with no malice. It was just that there's no, there was no path forward visible. It, it was like a Lewis and Clark thing. It's like, well, where are you going? What, what, what is that? Uh, not to overstate my experience, but that was pretty close to his experience, you know. When, uh, so he's a guy in the 60s at an estate, looking the way he does, and I'm an Asian American actor trying to do something where I have very few, if any, uh, role models to aim for, you know, to guidepost. To. So in some ways, I think that uh, when I, and I'll tell it from my perspective, when I got the script, I couldn't believe that somebody would, would have written something. It, it, I don't, again, I don't want to overstate it. I know there's like documentaries about like honor killings and stuff. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's keep it all in. We're doing great. But, like, <laughs> when, uh, when I read it, I was like, you know, geez, this is uh, so acutely uh, bullseye to my experience and to, and I think the experience of being, uh, there's a lot of Asian people here, like your relationship <laughs> to your parents and, um, to me, is such an internal experience. I don't think anyone until Alan and Aziz was able to put that into a narrative that was fun to watch. You know, like so. The first and foremost, it's funny, and then it's also it's like, yeah. It's, I'll say it really quick. Um, yeah. There's one woman right now who I think you could put on a poster and open the movie, and that's Melissa McCarthy. Yeah. And so I don't understand why every girl in LA wants to look exactly. All their butts are like this big, <laughs> and like. They have the exact same highlights, and, and there's literally there's a poster of Melissa McCarthy like sliding across the floor in front of June Law, and I'm like, that's why don't they all want to look like that? It doesn't make sense to me. It's a movie star. I, yeah, that's a movie star. So I think when you are number one on the call sheet, when you're the Aziz or the Melissa McCarthy, people live in your experience, and they they overestimate beauty. I think or the general public overestimates beauty. Jack Nicholson is not handsome. He never was. <laughs> So much more interesting than here. So I, I think uh, aesthetic, being aesthetic with music, if you just walk around Silver Lake or Venice, <laughs> uh, you know, you throw a rock and you'll hit somebody. That's also, go for it, man. Just go be an actor. Just do yeah, it. just go be an actor. Oh. All right, Please. thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding to like the future generation of diverse Asian actors, um, I'm a huge fan of the show. I binge watch it when I do my homework. Um, but I know just uh, I go to an art school, and the first thing I heard as soon as this show dropped was all the Asian kids. They were super excited because they were super inspired, like the theater department, because there's not a lot of Asian actors. So they're super inspired because it gives them like the hope that they can also be a main character and not just a side character that's just there for laughs. So how does it make you feel that you guys are really inspiring like the next generation of diverse actors? Uh, I'm like, te I'm literally tearing up right now. It's like, that's like, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. That, that just means so much. And, and, and I want to, I just want, if, if that's actually happening, that's great. I, I want people to, to, I want Asian people to be creative and, and do as many different things as possible, you know? I, 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 like, I want more characters in movies who look like you and have awesome hair and have headphones on and like go to art school. Can be offensive to black people? How, how about it, Aisha? Like, what do you think? <laughs> That's not average thing for everybody. <laughs> the more people you get, even if there's two people, three people, like the more the more it becomes uh, normal or sort of the representation is fuller, the less you feel that onus on you to speak for everybody. Because I don't want to speak for everybody. That's insane. Um, you handle the Oscar one. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Everyone knows what the Oscar joke is, right? Yeah, you guys are aware of it. Yeah. 
Uh, this girl's nodding, but shaking her head. Yo, when they come down next time. Okay, yeah, well, take care of it. Tell her. Go ahead. Hold on one second. She's going to figure out what I'm doing. You're done. Pull up the clip. Pull up the clip. Uh, we talked about it a little, so, uh, but I think uh, we agree that Chris Rock is one of the funniest people on the planet, if yeah. not the funniest. Um, I think the, the disappointment, at least for me, was that there weren't more Asian jokes. So was, <laughs> I wish there was six. Um, the problem is there was one, and it wasn't funny. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the real problem for me. If you make me laugh, but you somehow offend me, but I laugh, you got it somehow. It's, a, it's like an internal indicator that you got, you, you nailed some truth. And these guys, you know, the, the Louis C.K.'s, the Chris Rock's, the top, the cream of the crop, they're, they're like tennis players. They're aiming for the line. They're aiming for the corner. So I understand if they miss it by a little. That's fine. But that was a weak joke. That was a, like a 19, that was a 60 year old stereotype about. And it wasn't even that clear when they joked. So I, I think my only disappointment is that one of you know, both of our comedic idols. But you know what, it speaks to something else, and I'll, I'll say this, like, it speaks to a little bit of opacity about what is funny about Asian people, or like, I don't think it's that clear. Even Chris Rock, even one of the funniest people on the planet, doesn't quite know how to nail us. And, uh, and I think that's the thing, it's like, they say about actors, like, it's a really, it's a good thing if you're impersonatable. You know, if, if you're Pacino, or if you're walk-in, because it means that people understand your rhythms, or their or they can, you know, you've gotten in their skin. As, as a general model that has an Asian community, I don't know that people quite know what we're all about or what's <laughs> funny. Like, we're not, you know, it's not a clean scan. So that was kind of interesting to me. It's like, we're good at math. It was the best they could come up with in six months of 15 writers at the top of their game. We're good at math. Okay, moving on. Let's bring it up. She has Sophia Vergara's boobs. <laughs> Uh, it's it's pretty diverse, man. I think it's that. <laughs> great, great. Everyone knows what the Oscar joke is, right? <laughs> yeah, you guys are aware. Yeah. Uh, this girl's nodding, but shaking her head. Yo, when they come down next time. Okay, yeah. Well, take care of her. Tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hold on one second. She's going to figure out what I'm doing. You're done. You're good. Pull up the clip. Pull up the clip. We talked about it a little, so, uh, yeah. but I think uh, we agree that Chris Rock is one of the funniest people on the planet, yeah. if not the funniest. Um, I think the, the disappointment, at least for me, was that there weren't more Asian jokes. So was, <laughs> I wish there was six. Um, the problem is there was one, and it wasn't funny. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the real problem for me. If you make me laugh, but you somehow offend me, but I laughed, you got me somehow. It's, a, it's like an internal indicator that you, got, you, you nailed some truth. And these guys, you know, the, the Louis C.K.'s, the Chris Rock's, the top, the cream of the crop, they're, they're like tennis players. They're aiming for the line. They're aiming for the corner. So I understand if they miss it by a little. That's fine. But that was a weak joke. That was a, like a 19, that was a 60 year old stereotype about. And it wasn't even that clear when they joked. <laughs> so I, I think my only disappointment is that one of, you know, both of our comedic idols. But you know what? It speaks to something else. And I'll, I'll say this like, it speaks to a little bit of opacity about what is funny about Asian people, or like, I don't think it's that clear. Even Chris Rock, even one of the funniest people on the planet, doesn't quite know how to nail us. And, uh, and I think that's the thing, it's like, they say about actors, like, it's a really, it's a good thing if you're impersonatable. You know, if, if you're Pacino, or if you're walk-in, because it means that people understand your rhythms, or, they're, or they can, you know, you've gotten in their skin. As, as a general model that has an Asian community, I don't know that people quite know what we're all about or what's funny. Like, we're not, you know, it's not a clean scan. So that was kind of interesting to me. It's like, we're good at math. It was the best they could come up with in six months of 15 writers at the top of their game. We're good at math. Okay, moving on. Let's bring it up. She has Sophia Vergara's boobs. So, I, you know, that, that, that's my take on it. I was disappointed in how unfunny it was. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of gender and people of color is your own production? Uh, it's, it's 
pretty diverse, man. And I think it's that thing where they did a study, uh, you know, when there's a female director, the crew is just naturally more female. It's just like, you start seeing, you start seeing people, right? So, look, our writer's room last year was, was really diverse. I mean, it was gender-wise um, and Asian people-wise. <laughs> And, and, and uh, this this year, we're, we're probably going to rotate a lot of writers in and out. So acutely uh, bullseye to my experience and to, and I think the experience of being, uh, there's a lot of Asian people here, like your relationship <laughs> to your parents, and uh, to me, is such an internal experience. I don't think anyone until Alan and Aziz was able to put that into a narrative that was fun to watch. You know, like, so... The first and foremost, it's funny, and then it's also there's a little medicine in there. So I was really grateful to be, to be part of it. Cool. So you guys go pick up for season two. Uh, we're, we're super excited about that. Um, and bonus, you guys got the Critics' Choice Award. Which was pretty awesome. Um, and Alan, <laughs> I think you know what I'm thinking about it. Oh, what do you accept it? Yeah. Um, do you mind if I read what you said? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, uh, you said, uh, what, where, where, um, uh, about the straight white guys dominating, you think the straight guy, white guys dominating uh, the industry and uh, movies and TV so hard for so long so that stories about anyone else seem kind of fresh and original now. Um, <laughs> was, I definitely that was like, that was an old, old like, Everyone got woke, as the kids say, right? <laughs> um, was that off the cuff, or was that like, you were, that was like walk and loaded, you're all, I want to say this, I'm sorry. Oh, he's going to say this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're not supposed to swear up here, because I don't know. Swear, but What's the policy? I mean, we will just not. I'll avoid it. I'll avoid it. <laughs> um, you said vaginas. Yeah. Oh, you said vaginas. That's a medical term. <laughs> Was that locked and loaded in your head, or were you just like, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, <laughs> don't make me say it. I, I, didn't, I honestly didn't think it would be particularly incendiary. I mean, like, you know, it, it's funny too, because I, I had thought, I basically like, man, there's a small chance that we might win, so I think I had thought of it, but not very much before walking up there. Like, you know, I had, I had, a, had a couple of vodka sodas, so, uh, but uh, yeah, it was crazy, man, because also, like, you're there, and like, you're looking at Matt Damon. You know, <laughs> like, BBA to Matt Damon. Were there. So, I mean, but it, you know, yeah, together. together so, it was, it was real scandal because that dude's married. Um, you know, um, yeah. So you know, that's the thing. Is like, it, it, it was actually a conversation I was having a few days ago with Mike Schur, who's a producer on this show. And, you know, he created Parks and Rec, and I worked with him for a long time. And we were talking about. I think I said that same thing to him basically because. You know, it's. I don't think it's malicious. I think it's like, look, those white guys are fuck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> those white guys are amazing, and you know they're great. But like all these great, all these directors and writers are. They, they've done